Hey, everybody. We're looking for some sponsors. If you're a business owner and you want to support the cause, please contact me at reformgangsters at gmail.com. the mental illness aspect of your father walking around with the robes. I mean, that's like what everybody asked me about. Do you know the chin? Was it true? Was he, was he normal? Was he, did he have mental illness? And you know, the word in the street was that it was, that it was an act. Of course, you know that like all the wise guys called it an act. Me personally, I don't, I, maybe some of it was, but not all of it. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was a boxer. Yes, I know that. He did have some damage um, uh, in part of his brain, but he was brilliant. And this, I know my father could have been the CEO of any company if he would have went a different route, right? He just knows how, he's very charismatic. He knows how to deal with people um, and he's fair. That, that, was, that was the one, you know, one thing about him and his business. He was very fair. Um, I'd have to say that that was very hard for me but when he walked around in a robe and slippers, he used to tell me, come on, we're going to walk, right? And I used to walk. And he, he, I, <laughs> I watch him put his pajamas on, right? The bathrobe goes over, the, the hood, sometimes a pea cap. Um, but he would make his hair very disheveled, right? And he'd say, come on, we're going to walk. So I'd watch him get into character, right? And then he'd say to me, you know, make like you're holding me up. Now, yeah, here's a six foot guy, I'm like five one, right? Where am I holding him up? Yeah, All yeah. right. So the part of me that would walk down the street with him and be proud, the daughter that would be proud. And when people would, you know, stare and like say something to the person next to him, I go to myself, I'd say, and fuck you. Like, you don't know, you know, you don't know us, you don't, right? And they're judging. And the other part, part of me would be laughing because he'd stand in front of a parking meter or he'd be talking to a tree or whatever it was, yeah, yeah. you know, and mumbling. And so it would take a lot for me not to laugh. Um, but what, what was very difficult was when he would check himself into St. Vincent's uh, medical facility in Harrison and we would have to go visit. And he was on the third floor with um, the schizophrenics and the bipolar and whatever other illnesses that you know mental illnesses were up there so he was um you know feigning that piece he would check himself in if he thought the fbi was getting close to him having to go there was very hard because it was almost like there's real there's real people here that are sick and, it, and it's like he was making a mockery of that you know and i thought to myself this is just not right i know why he did it Mm -hmm. I, I understood it and I would, <clears throat> I'd be in the room and because my energy was very sensitive, I, they, what, I'm what you would call an empath, that kind of sensitivity, I would walk, I could walk in a room and feel everybody's everything. And if I didn't protect myself, I, I could immediately get extremely exhausted and fall asleep. And a lot of times I would fall asleep in that room because of it, but not before. I watched the nurse come in, give him his pills. She'd check his mouth. She'd leave. He'd spit the pills out yeah. in a tissue, give them to my mother and say, take them home and flush them down the toilet. You know, and I would just be shaking my head. Okay. So that was the hardest piece. The other piece of him walking in the bed, I mean, I, I, you know, I witnessed that at such an early age. This, I just knew who he was, but didn't know who he was. You know, it was that kind of thing. I didn't know till I was 16, yeah. truly who he was till I was 16. So um, that piece was very difficult. And we all had to participate in that, yes. including my grandmother. You know, so if a psychiatrist came to the, to the, to the apartment, 
my grandmother would be yelling in Italian, Via Medellin, get him his medicine, he's going crazy, you know. And, and he would, in front of the doctors, be able to, you know, put the act on. Maybe we'd, we'd always have cartoons on. So maybe he would mimic a cartoon you know, or whatever. And I, it, it would take everything inside of me sometimes not to burst out laughing. And then in the same sense, I was like, but fuck, there are so many people out there really sick. And there was a piece of me when I was young that was very afraid that it would, that I could get something like that. Was it genetic? You know, all of that. So there was trauma where that was concerned too. But it's, it's talking about the violence piece. I just, so, you know, our fathers are tied together with Frank Costello. I don't right. know if you know the story. All right. So, you know, your father is allegedly the shooter of Frank Costello. Right. When Frank Costello got shot in the hallway, they actually picked up my father, too. At this, because my father had the same built as your father, the same kind of hair. You know, like they, they resembled each other, you know, and my father was very active back then. And they picked up my father and actually took him to the hallway and made him run in and out of the hallway because there was somebody saw somebody and uh, and eventually they let my father go and they blamed it on your father but they both were the two suspects of that shooting. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, yeah. My father told me the whole story. Yeah. Yeah. They, and then they blamed your father. Allegedly, he was the guy that guy that did it. So we go back. That was in the fifties. So we go back a long way. Wow. Yeah. How did you deal with that, with all the violence? Well, I actually, um, when I when I said before I had a you know anxiety at the age of five, I actually witnessed something um, underneath my grandmother's table, and um, you know he was beating a man. Brought him, then nobody knew I was under the table because it would have never happened if yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah it would have never happened. So. Um, I, I was hiding because I heard the voices and, they, and I heard him and he was angry. And I, I just remember the guy hitting the floor and there was blood like trickling to me, you know, like to my feet. And I just um, kind of went into shock, you know, at that point. And when they realized I was under the table and they took me out, I, I was, I, I probably was stunned for like hours. I was crying. I was, you know, uh, was just a mess. And at that moment, the, the little, you know, the little child inside of me kind of broke. And I was petrified of him from that moment on. Um, so that as I got older, the times where he was gentle, I, I almost questioned it in a sense. It felt really good when he was that way. But then I remember that other side of him that could, could be violent, you know, and I didn't know how violent uh, he could get, but even if it was him, you know, saying to somebody, go do this, that was his word and that's what happened, you know? So dealing with the reality of that and then thinking, is that, can that actually, can I, can I get that way? Like, can I get that, you know, where I could hurt somebody? And growing up, I did hurt a few people, never, never killed anybody, never, it wasn't like that, but because of my um, anxieties and fears and phobias and everything that was happening to me, because I didn't know anything, like nobody was explaining anything to me that was going on. I had, you know, I was, it was a guessing game. Um, I heard a couple of people along the way, you know, with my hands and uh, regretted it, you know, regretted it as I went forward and then, and then my life changed completely. So that, that all kind of just fell to the wayside and realized I had to take my aggression out in a different way or my anger or my frustration or my fear out in a different way. And I, I realized that the fear is what drove me to, you know, do, do things like that, things that weren't productive, things that would hurt, hurt somebody, you know? Um, so, it was devastating to some degree to know that he was had that capability. And I'm like, and then I thought to myself, maybe everybody has that capability at, mm. at one point, you know, um, if they're pushed to that point. But this wasn't a matter of that. This was a matter of, you know, he 
wasn't even a matter of money for him. It was really a matter of power. They're just like your father. They believed in that life. Like there was no other life. Like they, they, they were right. Like they, they just believed in it. I mean, it, I got him when I, I started working for my father at 16. So, mm -hmm. and then he started explaining to me about like, you know, murders he committed. And I was okay with it because I was just wrapped up in it. You know, now today, when I think back at it, like he would tell me, like fathers and sons sit down and talk about like building a wooden table or whatever, right. you right. know, building a car, putting together an engine. You know, he would sit down with me and tell me about how he murdered somebody. And I was right. like, oh, wow, that's great. You know what I mean? Like I, I just was totally lost. Unlike you, I was the complete opposite at that point. And later on in life, I actually committed acts of violence with my father. Like he wanted me to kill somebody and I told him no and he got mad at me. Right. I mean, that's where our relationship winded up, you know, right. how and how. So, so now I think back at it, how could I was so innocent and then I became this violent criminal and he was okay with it. Like I knew he would go in the morning and hurt somebody and then come home and take my brother to the Little League game. And right. he that was just part of his job, you know? It, right. You know, and when you tell people that they, 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 that's why the public is like, holy shit. Like, it's just um, now today when I think of it, I, you know, it's like, how did, you know, we were so wrong, but we thought right. we were so right. Right. And the one thing I know my father never wanted and never did was get my brothers involved in any of it. Mm -hmm. He would not allow it. He would, they would never be made. I mean, that's just, was he didn't want anybody in that life. He says, it ends here with me and that's the end of it. Yeah, my father used to tell me about your father. He was crazy like a fox. That's what he used to tell me all the time. He goes, he goes, the chin's crazy like a fox. But uh, just think, you know, when I think of your father, I think of like to him to live that way, to, to, to do that, it took a lot, you know, like that oh was, I mean, that was to go to check yourself into a psych ward and to live under them conditions. I can't even imagine. Yeah, like, I mean, the extremes he went through to, yeah. to, to, to not to go to prison. I mean, it worked for all those years, but just, you know, I, I think of the extremes he went through. Like, he had some constitution to live that way. To, to oh, yeah. Balls to do all that, let me tell you. And he was, and especially, he was such a, he was so powerful. I mean, he had, who had more power than him? He was, you know, he was the boss. I right. Mean, he had so much power. He had so many people under him that, you know, at his beck and call and to live that way was, you know, um, I remember him. when, you know, I remember hearing when he came out of prison the first time, he said, I'm, I'm never going back, right? He would never go back. And it took many, many, many years and only because of the RICO Act yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and hearsay yeah. did he go back in, but he never wanted to go back to prison. And then as I looked at his life, I thought to myself, he was never really out of prison oh. because he only went certain places. He, he never, other than my mother's, at, other than their honeymoon, he'd never really been anywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and he went into a mental, you know, a mental, uh, I guess, institution, you can call a hospital. That to me is a prison, you know, walking around, not being able to be who you need to be. Mm -hmm. That's a prison. You know, so the bars really meant nothing as far as I was concerned. I felt bad that he didn't really enjoy himself here. When you were a kid, did you feel like something was different about your father? Like when I used to go into my friends' houses, their fathers would have legitimate jobs and they would come home at a certain time and they would all have dinner together. And even oh my, my uncle, my cousins, and I always knew something was different with my father, but I never knew what, and I knew... When I used to go to school and the teacher would ask me what my father did for a living, my father used to tell me that he worked in the dry cleaners. And I always <laughs> knew as a young kid that really wasn't true, but I used to say it anyway. Did you have right. any experiences sort of like that? 100%. In my house, he worked in a hat company um, or for a hat company. You know, that was before I got told he was very sick. Right. And um, I remember going to my friend's houses and, you know, um, having dinner and thinking, oh my God, like this man is like really interested in, in what his kids did that day. Right. You know? Whereas right. I think I had 10 words total between yeah. me and my father yeah. when I sat at the table with him, yeah. you know? Yeah. How'd you feel about our fathers being womanizers? 
Well, I was extremely close to my mother, very close. So I never saw my dad that way until I was told that he had another family, to be quite honest. Um, I always thought he was very genuine in that way when it came to my mother, because he was very, very affectionate with her, mm -hmm. very. Um, and he was affectionate with us, you know, with, with me anyway. Um, so I, I, it, after I found out, I was shocked. I was like, wow, I didn't know that that was part of the whole thing. Then I realized that, you know, this is part of the whole energy of that life, you know? And so, you know, I realized that, okay, was it just, one other person but then I thought to myself probably not <laughs> you know? mm. and so I, I was completely hurt for my mother um it's not what I believed in um but I know when you're caught up in that life that that's you know that's how they do things and it's really all part of the ego you know it, it boosts their ego and uh, it gave them whatever they needed to move through the life, but it made it quite hard on, on us having another, you know, set of siblings that we didn't know about. And then my mother, her whole life had to, you know, deal with it because she truly loved him. This, this wasn't like, you know, I, at the beginning, she actually wanted to leave and he begged her, you know, to stay and he would, he would change and there would be you know, nobody else and all of that, but he could never, he could never hold to that. And that was very painful for my mother. Yeah, it's, you know, I got goosebumps right now because it's so similar to, to my story, you know, because when I was a little kid, like I said, my mother would drag me all over Brooklyn. I remember one time going into an apartment, my mother, to the day she died, she couldn't believe I remembered this. I went, in, she went into an apartment building and rang a doorbell and I must have been maybe four or five and the, a girl answered the door and she told me, that's your father's girlfriend. And they started fighting in the hallway. Because now she was only in her early 20s, my mother. So she was a kid, really. And they started right. fighting in the hallway. And I was crying. And, Ma, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. Right. But I, I didn't understand it. But when I got older, it's funny because when I got older, I was in my early 20s and my father owned a bar. And I walked in there one night and there was this very good looking blonde young girl working behind the bar, very attractive woman working behind the bar that I had never seen before. It was like, so I right. walked up and I introduced myself. I'm Anthony and she told me her name was Marion. And I started hitting on her because she was, I was, you know, she was attractive and, 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 and I'm talking to her and a, a friend of mine says, come here, I want to talk to you. And he took me off to the side. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to, you know, she's good looking. I'm going to try to, you know, get with her. He goes to me, that's your father's girlfriend. I was like, what? I, I, even though I was in the life at the time, I was still, a, you know, like I, I couldn't figure, right. you know, he's my father with this young, pretty girl. Like, you know, and, right. and he was like, my mother was madly in love with him. You know, it was just a whole, yeah. you know, and, and it took me by a little by surprise that she was his girlfriend. Yeah, well, I, you know, my mother and father, you know, grew up together. My grandmothers knew each other. Right. So they were babies you know, playing on the roof with my grandmothers and, and, you know, 12 years old was their first kiss. So this was like a, yeah. this was like a, you know, a long haul relationship. This wasn't, they met, you know, when they were in their twenties. And so my mother always, I remember saying to my mother, why couldn't you walk away? And she would say, she would say to me, cause I remember the innocence of him. I remember the 12 year old boy. He wasn't always like this. Yeah, yeah. He got brought into this and he changed, right. you know, but yeah, she always yeah. gave him and she always remembered that side of him. And I guess I, I had to put myself in, in, in order to look at him differently and even her differently. It's almost like I put myself in their shoes and say, okay, how, how, would I, you know, how would it feel if I were in their shoes? And it helped with the forgiveness piece. Yeah, so sure. that's, you know, that was huge for me because I, I was, it was so hurtful for her, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And that woman that I would say, the, the woman that had his other three children was pregnant at the same time my mother was to me, she was pregnant. Right, yeah. yeah. Only mm -hmm. a six months difference. Right. So, 
that that was just horrifying for her. I know. I mean, I, I have I have I know other siblings of wise guys like you and I that experienced this. It's crazy how all our stories are so similar that we all experience the same situations with our fathers. I just I guess that was just part of that, the life. And I mean, even when I got into life, I did the same thing. I'm not innocent. You know, I had right. a wife, unfortunately, because that's all I knew. I, you know, right. that's all I knew, you know, and, and I did the same thing. My mother was, in, my father was the affectionate one, believe it or not, more than my mother for some reason, I guess, because my mother was always wrapped up in her relationship. My mother was a kid when she, she was only 19 when she had me. So my mother was like a jealous teenager. You know, she used to drag me all over Brooklyn when I was a little kid looking for my father. Cause you know, he always had girlfriends and you know, right. you know how they lived. And 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 I was just being dragged all over town. And, but my father, when the, when he was home, he was very um, playful because he wasn't home that much. So I guess, you know, he right. thought, you know, to make up for the time he wasn't home. So my yeah. childhood was very traumatic. Oh my God. I, I think my first, um, my first anxiety attack was at the age of five. Um, and then I started having panic attacks at the age of seven. Right. Uh, but the time I was 10 years old, it was full blown. And then in order to kind of deal with what felt like such uncertainty was OCD. So mm -hmm. I became very obsessive compulsive. My father was very obsessive compulsive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it was very helpful in getting some semblance of, you know, um, feeling like I had some kind of control, and even though it's a false control, right. it, it actually helped me. That and sports helped me get through my childhood. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I remember going to, you know, I remember going to my friend's house thinking, oh my God, this is like phenomenal. And they, their fathers would ask me questions about my day, yeah. you know, right. and because I was a big football and baseball, you know, mm -hmm. uh, person back then. Right. I could share that kind of stuff with their father, whereas maybe because they were girls, they didn't really share that with him, you know, right. so he was, al I was almost the boy that, you know, they didn't have. I don't know if you experienced it. He would take me with him to like his club and to bars and I was a kid and you know, when he walked in, he was like a celebrity, you know, like, and, and I loved, and they would stick money in my pocket, the people, and I would get to go behind the bar and play with the soda guns. And, you know, so I, I was, got all wrapped up in that, you know, it right. was like, right. I, I, I looked forward to that. I felt special. So I really what? started losing my identity. Well, I, I could understand that, especially being, you know, his son. Right. For me, it was more like he would he would take me I would be allowed to go which is unusual for him yeah. to take to his place of we'll say business or whatever but <laughs> yeah, right. I would love to watch him play cards because he was he just was such a natural yeah. you know and then you know we there was always there was a a refrigerator and there was always like coke coca-cola bottles or manhattan specials and there was always pastries in there yeah, so yeah, yeah and yes i was allowed behind the bar just to play around with the stuff yeah. but um i didn't experience that with people like putting money it was very different he he you know he was very protective of that side especially because i was a girl right. so you know they just um they were just so very nice you know yeah, to me right, exactly yeah nice guys and so you know they were all close i mean to us they were like family right. you know um so I, and i knew all their nicknames but god help me i didn't know their names but i knew their nicknames you know it was the craziest thing yeah. um but i loved going in there sometimes me and my cousins would go in there and play cards together um he taught me how to play you know um rummy and my mother loved to play rummy so uh, sometimes the three of us played which was which was nice it was a it was different I saw him differently when that, when he was able to do that, you know, he came out of character and uh, he just became a dad at that point or a husband, you know? Yeah. Um, so those are the times that I cherish with him. Same thing with me. You know, when I was a kid, he would take me horseback ride and he would take me to the Yankee game. He loved it. You know, he loved sports. My father, he loves boxing and he loved baseball right. and he loved music. So he would take me to, you know, 
the Yankee Stadium all the time, and he would take me horseback riding. He took me to all the boxing matches, you know, because the mark they had all the connections. So we got the best seats, right. you know. So so we had carte blanche, you know, and so we went to all these events, which was really nice. And then, well, for me, as I got older and I found out who he was, and I started learning about the mob stuff, and he was a wise guy. My whole it started changing for me. Like I wanted to get, I wanted to be him. Right, right. Understood. I, I can understand that. Were you the only son? No, I had a younger, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. He, my brother was very, a great student. My brother was a great student, St. John's University. But then what happened was he started making some money in the street and uh, he got a little taste of it. And he took a leave of absence from college and he never went back. And, mm. and then drugs got into the picture and it was, became uh, not, not good. I, I, yeah. you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm that person. I, I have no judgment with anyone because of how um, I've, you know, moved through my life. So I have no judgment. And honestly, I just pray for them because um, to me, it's the best thing. Like, you know, you can't, can't change things. You can't, you know, you can only just pray for somebody and hope that, you know, good things come to them. Yeah, I know. Cause you know? You're, you're a psychic. A psychic and a medium. So I can speak to the other side and he is tell him I said hello. <laughs> yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah. I will. And he's actually with so many of the guys um that he was with here. You know, he's with them. He's with my mother. Um and and it's funny because he's come to me in certain sessions where people want to be in that life and they come to me and they talk, ask me, you know, about it. And and I and I tell them, listen, my father's here and he's telling telling me to tell you, go a different direction. Yeah, I would do it. When did you figure that out that you could, when did you feel that? How old? Uh, I knew it probably in my mid twenties, but I didn't know, I had the gift when I was born. Um, and that was the whole piece of being an empath, being able to feel stuff. Um, but it didn't really come to, I would say fruition, um, probably, my mid twenties, it began, and then when I hit thirty, it, it became prominent. And and now, you know, now I'm fifty five, so it, it's been with me for a long time now. Anybody else in your family, or just got the gift, or just you? It's funny, you know. I always tell people everybody has a gift, and they have to, you know, especially women and and children. It's when they they have that gift of knowing the mothers. You know, they just know when something's going on with their children. Um, but I would say that my grandmother, for sure, because she had visions, she had visions of the Blessed Mother. Um, so I know she had it. My mother's mother also had the, a gift. Um, but I, I would say they, they don't connect to their gifts. Right. So I'm the one who connected to it and brought it to where I need to, you know. Um, yeah, so it, they come to me now and they, they ask me questions, you know. Yeah, you know, I winded up with a cocaine problem. I had to put myself into treatment in 1988. Wow. I went to treatment. Okay. You know, I was grew, grew up in the 70s, you know, I was in all the discos, all the clubs. You know, I was Fat Andy's son. I was in the club. I'm sure you, you experienced the Copacabana uh, routine, right? In the base. I, I, I used to go get into the Copa. You know, it was just a crazy time. And soon, and I developed, uh, you know, everybody was blowing coke in the 70s. So I joined in, you know, and then the next thing I knew, I, I put myself in treatment. And thank God I'm clean now 34 years, you know, but that was a, that was a, a hard time for me also. Oh, wow. That's awesome, though. God yeah. bless. Not everybody can do that. No, I know. I mean, I, you know, and, you know, I had some, you know, people who were like John Gotti, he, he, you know, he bought me a car when I got out of treatment. You know, Tony Lee, my father's partner, paid for the treatment center. So I had, I had guys powerful, you know, behind me, rooting for me, you know, so I wasn't alone in the situation. You know, people wanted me to get clean. My father, you know, uh, my father definitely wanted me to get clean. He was devastated because I was losing weight. And he was nervous that I was going to die. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a dark time, but, uh, you know, I overcame it. And then I got back into the street, you know what I mean? Because I'm, a, you know, that's what I did that because I'm, I don't know, I don't know if you experienced that, but so when I was 16 and working for my father, I had no life skills. When I got clean, I didn't know how to do anything but be a criminal. Right, right. 
you know, so so I, I that's what I did. And, and, and then I went to prison. I went to prison in 1991. I got out. Then I went to prison again in 1996. And then that's when I made a decision that, you know, I, I, I can't do this no more. My father died. John Gotti died. Tony Lee died. Everybody, you know, everybody that, that, that I had any kind of respect for died. So my whole attitude changed. And I think somewhere along the line, you may, I developed a conscience. And I think, I don't think guys like our fathers, and I don't mean it disrespectfully, I don't think they had a conscience. Well, I think they, you know, they thought that they were doing right. And, and some of what they did, they did right by people. I know my father would never let like an elderly person, if they were having problems with their rent, he paid their rents. You know, if anybody, nobody would ever starve. Like, you know, he protected the streets for, for people. So, you know, listen, there's, he, he used to say it all the time. The real organized crime is the government and the politicians and the this and the that. And I, I, you know, today when I look at that, I'm like, you know what? He's not wrong. You know, they're getting away with a lot of stuff, right? But I can't give him right either, you know, but they did have a code of ethics that, you know, a lot of other, um, I want to say, uh, organizations don't have. So that I can respect in a sense. Um, but conscience is, you, you know, the difference you, when you grow up in it, you may not know at the beginning the difference between what they call right and wrong. But it really is, what can I live with? What can I put my head on a pillow at night, you know, and be okay with it? And, um, and he could. Yeah. He, so, you know, the fact of what he did in the end, he started to change. He knew he wasn't coming out. And his energy, everything started to change with him. And uh, he protected us in the end because they could have, they they said they were coming for us. Whatever you could put your head, like my father could put his head, he could go out and do something like that and then come home. And like I said, take my brother to the Little League game. Like it was, you know, like it was nothing. And, you know, and, and then we, we were, the, were the, you know, were the casualties. Right. They were I, I spent 14 years in prison. Right. I was traumatized from my lifestyle. I missed my son. I missed half their lives. I mean, look what I gave up thinking that that way of life was the right way of life. When today, now I know I was so wrong. Right. Right. But, but was, you, you could have, you could have not come to that conclusion and then you would have just continued. So the fact that you did was huge yeah. and now they can benefit from seeing you change. Right. It, it was really hard. It was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. It was, it was very traumatic for me. To change my life like that i went from one extreme to, to another it was it was really really hard but you know at the end of the day i i knew that it was it was like sort of like drugs i hit a bottom with the drugs and i knew i needed to stop and i knew i needed to change it was the same way with the lifestyle i hit a bottom with the lifestyle and i knew it was time to change you know like to make a move and, and to do something different and take a leap of faith because like i said i had no education i had no skills but, you know, and I took a leap of faith and I went, I did what I did. I cooperated and, and, and I got out of that life and I went back to school. I became a counselor. You know, I worked in a treatment center. You know, it's so different. If someone would have told me this 40 years ago, I, I might have hit them in the face with you. It's crazy. I'm never going to do it. But, you know. Exactly. You know, so now when you came out, how was that? Okay. For me, it was very brutal in the beginning because when I came, tried to come out to my dad and my mom at 19, because I was getting physically sick because I wasn't living my truth. I kept having to hide. Now I'm looking at my dad, he's hiding, right? From whatever he, you know, the FBI or whoever, he's got his secrets. Now I got my secrets. As much as I hated his secret, that I had to keep the secret, right? right? So at 19, I did, I tried to come out and, you know, I, what I expected was a full-on beaten, to be honest with you. And what I got from him was worse. I got, he got very silent when it happened. And he just said to me, and very calmly, he's like, you're just going through a phase. He says, this happens sometimes. And, you know, and he went on and on. And then at the end, he said, and I don't want you to hang out with any of your girlfriends anymore. And I knew what that meant. And so I said, you know what, 
I said, I agree with you. I said, I think I'm just going through a phase. Yes. I don't know what the hell else to say. Mm -hmm. And I jumped right back in the closet, right? So to speak. And I was depressed, so depressed from it um, because they just couldn't understand that I knew at 11 years old who I was. Mm -hmm. And so at the age of 24, I said to my mother, I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, I'm physically ill because of it. I said, and I can't be. I said, I love you. I can tell you this. I know your fear is me going to hell or people torturing me because of it. That was the two things my mother was so afraid of. And I said, but I can tell you now I'm not going to hell because I don't even believe in it. Mm -hmm. I said, and as far as people torturing me, the, things are different now than they were when you were young. Yes. It's becoming more and more acceptable. And my mother hugged me and she says, I love you. She says, I'm, I'm here for you. I can, I'll accept it. She says, but I'll continue to pray. Um, maybe one day you'll get married, right? And I said, Ma, you know what? That's all I could ask for. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I said, but I'm not going to go to him. And she says, no, let's, let's just keep it between us. So he didn't know, but knew, yeah. you know, he didn't know, but he knew. He tried getting around me, asking everybody what's going on with her. Is she dating anybody? And, um, you know, I'd make up shit when I saw him and my family would. We all just had to have the, you know, the right story for it, even though I didn't want to. I didn't. I wanted to come clean with him, but I just knew he couldn't accept it, you know. And when he before he passed. You know, if you read my book, you'll see there was a, a forgiveness letter that I wrote to him and it completely changed his view of me before he died. Mm -hmm. And so it was the beginning of the redemption and the the healing between him and I. And now he he all totally understands, you know, there's absolutely no um, ego in the spirit world. So he loves my wife. Um, you know, my mother, my mother, my, my wife took care of my mother before she passed because she's a nurse. Right. And so it was a beautiful, beautiful transition from one thing to, to another in, in the life. But I suffered quite a bit before that, you know, with it. And, but would I do it over? I would not do it. I, I would, I would do, I would do nothing different. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Because it really made me who I am today, got me to the place I needed to be. And um, I turned it around. You know what? You need somebody to bounce things off of always um, just to just to clear it. You know, I remember when I went to therapy the first time I put myself in therapy. I got told by my family, you don't talk about anything. You don't talk about anything else but your anxiety. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah. My anxiety is because of all of you. <laughs> yeah. I wanna, you know, I want to help myself and I want to help somebody else along the way because this helps me just as much as it helps somebody else talking about it, you know, getting it out there, you know, um, and, and because until I started talking about it and writing about it, I didn't even realize like what was going, you know, like what I was doing, you know, right. even with my relationship, like I told you earlier, my relationship with my mother, I had, I had, I had a resentment towards her for dragging me around when I was a kid. Sure, sure. And I, you know, when I got clean, I got into a 12 step program. I don't know if you're familiar with 12 step program. Yes. I got into a 12 step program. And I, when, when I wrote my first real honest fourth step, I realized for the first time when I was 36 years old that my mother was a kid with kids. Right. And I forgave her. And so when I wrote about it and I realized it, that made me, you know, I forgave her and it changed our relationship. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to work on ourselves. That's what I tell people. It takes work. It took work for you. It takes work. It took it's taking work for my daughter. It just takes work. Absolutely. And you got to be willing to do it. It's worth it in the end. That I can tell you. Yeah. You do the work, you and, and it's so worth it in the end. Right. And then so, it is a saying, it works if you work it, so work it, you're worth it. <laughs> that's right. I love that. You like that? Yeah. yeah. How's the book, uh, the book you wrote? How oh, was that? I had to be a little liberating. Yeah, it was, oh my God, so cathartic. It was part of my healing process. It went very well in the beginning. Then it, it died down. I'm, I'm going to resurrect it again. 
very shortly so that I can, um, because I've been doing more podcasts and people are asking about it and more people are wanting to, you know, read about it. And then it, listen, it, 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 I wrote it so that I could help people that that was the whole, you know, there's nothing in there that there's no tell all there's nothing. This is my life, how I came through it, how I became who I am now, right. you know, based on the parents that I had, anybody could write a book like that you know, and, and help people. But that was, that's the premise of it. It's the premise going to moving forward. So, um, I, we, we, we have, our stories are unique. Our fathers, yeah. it, it, it was, it, the mob is a unique lifestyle. And I think that's what interests people. It's not, it's such a minor, minute amount of people that can live that lifestyle, put their heads on, like we talked about earlier, do what they did and then come home and put their head on a pillar and go to Absolutely. sleep. Absolutely. And there's not many people that could do that. And that's, I think, what, what sparks people's interest in us right now. Sure. Find if I could get my message out, you know. And I love to, that's what I love to do. I love to tell, you know, because a lot of kids, even when, you know, in my job as a counselor, you know, I have all these kids, they're all like gang. They think they're tough guys. I've been in prison. And, you know, and then when I tell them a little bit about myself, they're like, holy shit, really? And then now I got them. And the, the, once they identify with that, then I could, you know, I could work with them and, and, and they, I sort of, they sort of start respecting me. And once they do that, then I could, you know, get them maybe to, you know, go into treatment or, you know, do some, some work on themselves. 